And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Miltra, and with me I have two of my good brothers. We have the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, Good brother Xanatrix, and making his making his debut to this particular segment, the man who is eternally late and gay, the drunkest man in the room, good brother Doku. It is once again that time to enter the Valley of the Judged. Well, it's good to be here again, and you're right, Doku is quite late and gay. Doku. For once you're I'm actually on time though, what the hell? You were supposed to be here three sessions ago! <laughs> Time is relative. Don't maybe bring up the Andromeda Paradox. You know what? If you bring up that bullshit, all I'll say <laughs> is you're still so late and gay, you've missed time. You've literally gone out of time and come back in. It's all a matter of perspective. Also, where's my shield? You don't get a shield. Where's my fucking Dragonator? Do I at least get a gauntlet? <laughs> no. Yes. No, he does get a gauntlet, just not for his arm. Go fight every boss in Monster Hunter Rise without any armor or weapons. Oh, that's just mean. I thought you're I thought you were gonna have him I thought you were gonna have him go through the original gauntlet. Well that's too much of a good thing. I'm trying to torture him. Have you Wait, have you even <laughs> I'm not talking about legends, I'm talking about the original one. Yes, I have. It, it's it's good for the time it's in. Should have asked for a boot. <laughs> nah. <laughs> That's low hanging fruit. Even I'm not going to reach for that one. <laughs> Damn. Well, I tried. <laughs> so last last week, I kind of hinted at the at the next class that we would be tackling, which it which is it's now time to fire off that Chekhov's gun because this week. The Valley of the Judge continues our trek through the Level Up 5e playtest, and we are handling the Druid. Which me which is going to be interesting for me. Because first off, there's there's the fact that with some with something like the Druid, I will I'll be Well, for starters, we have our first proper casting class in this series but second we have an instance of de of dealing with a cl dealing with a class that I have had a very checkered history with not the least of which them stealing his threads <laughs> but <clears throat> the fir the primary issue is the fact that Druids, aside from the fact that you've got certain purists who think that they should just be a um, a pa a package for clerics, which I ne which is something I've never agreed with, you have the there is no way I can talk about them without talking about the unholy abomination that was the druid class in three point five. Now. Third edition Druid Druids started out okayish, and then natural spell was introduced as a feat. <laughs> Which meant now here's here's the thing. One of the key one of the key features with Druids is is the fact that when they're in wild shaping, they can't use magic. Which makes sense. You know, with all the component requirements that magic is supposed to have, even though nobody actually pays attention to them. But with natural spell, that particular problem is worked around. So you've got so you've got a druid who can already kick ass in their animal form and use their magic. Having a werebear cast moonbeam at you is uh is quite surprising for many mobs. So you can have ridiculously buffed bears who can summon more bears <laughs> and Werebear uh, Army. And br and br and um and all the ins all the insane 
all the insanity with the wizard with a with a bit with a set of stats that allows them to actually actually be tanky this is the this is the reason why Godzilla became such a popular meme short for a cleric or a druid because those the problem the problem is this is an example of how, of how not to unbalance. I'm perfectly fine with their with there not being complete 100% balance all across the board in games. Where I draw the line is when certain um, classes or certain builds are so good they end up stepping into the territory of other people, and that's exactly what you have with the druid. Like why why play a fighter when you can when you can um do, when you can be just as tanky. And also get also get a few spells in by playing cleric or druid. Yep. Not to mention the fact that with three point five and its uh, splat book frenzy, uh, you eventually got the ultimate unholy spawn that started with cleric or druid. A little thought experiment that never saw, uh, saw the tables and honestly should never have seen the light of day. A little, and I do mean little. Uh, <clears throat> lizardy guy named Pun Pun, pun, pun. the Magic <laughs> Kobold. Oh God, Pun Pun. <sighs> With five levels, five character levels, split amongst three different classes from like three different splat books, and using spell-like abilities from two others, you could literally make a character that had an arbitrary amount of attribute points not modifiers points an arbitrarily high amount and the reason they say arbitrarily high is because using the abilities over and over again wasn't limited because of the specific ability they would use to imbue all the other abilities on themselves made all abilities spell like abilities that were at will <sighs> and in so doing you get pun pun who do you want 20,000 in every stat? There you go, 20,000 in every stat. <laughs> Do you want 70 million in every stat? There you go, 70 million in every stat. Your attribute points could be however the fuck high you wanted them to be, and thus all derived stats from there were however the fuck high you wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. And that is the ultimate expression of the insanity started by Godzilla. The And... Stuff like Pon Pon will always be engraved in my mind whenever people, whenever somebody like John Wick t tells me that balance is not necessary. <laughs> See, it's it's good that Pun Pun was just a thought experiment in the annals of TG, rather than actually ever hitting the tables. Yeah. It it's right up it's right up. The it's right up there with the arrow of total destruction, which I only let someone use once after they paid out the fucking ass for it. The arrow of total destruction. That thing's fucking broke, too. <laughs> uh. short, ver short version, divide by zero in arrow form. <laughs> that's like the uh, psionic... That's like saying that a psionic manifester in, in, in epic levels, any manifester cast, class can basically manifest anything they want, which led to one of my players going, that means they can manifest void. They can manifest nothingness. I'm like, yes, no, you're not allowed to fuck off. <laughs> it, in a, now some, now, if, and if people think that these sort of rule bendings is kind of extreme, keep in mind that there have been equally ridiculous amounts of rule bendings in real sports. In <laughs> fact, Secret Base has an entire series of, of this kind of thing called That's Weird, <laughs> also known as Weird Rules. Things like the Holy Roller in the 70s, the Rob Ray rule because Rob Ray kept taking his shirt off during hockey fights. <laughs> um... A rule specific, a rule specifically designed around, um, around the fact that Shaq kept breaking everybody's rims, <laughs> and, it, and the and the ultimate question in baseball: What happens when a switch pitcher and a switch hitter are opposite each other? <laughs> 
Because that happened in it. That happened between two minor league teams in um in the New York area, and the MLB immediately had 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 to do, had to do a panic move because they saw what was going on. They were like, "If this ha- we cannot let this happen in the MLB. It's bad enough that this happens in the minors." So they so they immediately put out a rule saying. In the in the situation where you have two where you have a switch hitter and a switch pitcher, the switch hit the switch pitcher has priority about which side he's gonna pick. But that's what I can understand in the in the in that situation why that wasn't taken into account because that's one of those one in a million kind of things. You know, just having mm-hmm. two people who are ambidextrous. Yep. Um and of course, there's the in, there's the infamous um, holy holy roller in foot in football, where as a means to ex, as a means to extend a, as a means to extend a play, they kept um, grabbing the ball and pretend and pretending to fumble it and just and literally kick the thing down the road. Yep. And immediately the NFL goes, guys, no, just no, you can't do that. So. Rule finding way finding ways to break the rules is not something that's exclusive to geek shit. I just feel, and the dru- but the druid is one of the is one of the poster childs for people finding ways to break the game. And incidentally, this sort of game breaking is also why I found it absolutely hilarious when the Book of Nine Swords came out and you had a bunch of casting players. Winding that, winding that, giving these spell-like effects to martial characters was stepping on the toes of casters. And as we've always said, the uh, <clears throat> the addition of player choice is never a bad thing. Mm-hmm. As far as far as I'm concerned, some of those toes need to be stepped on because. <laughs> But, um, of course, third edition also had the blighter for people who want to do evil druids. Although, as far as I recall, nobody actually did it. Um, there were there were in, there were an interesting fluff spin on um on druids with scarred lands, which is actually a really good setting. I. It's more. It 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 appears grim dark, but it's more um it's more noble dark. Like the world is fucked, but the but people are trying to fix it. Yeah. Um. Rather than the world is fucked and everybody is downtrodden. Yeah. And um, now of course, when Pathfinder came around, they tr- they tried to take some steps to nerf, but the problem. The problem whenever Pathfinder tries to fix something that was an issue in D&D is that they only take half measures. Um, and usually against the wrong facet as well. Yeah. Like, in Path in Pathfinder... Now, I'm not referring to Pathfinder 2nd Edition with this, just just um first. But shapeshifting only added to your ability scores instead of replacing them. So, if you were to... So, you can't just, you can't just be surprised good at melee... Um, animal companions advancing um, completely differently, sometimes slower, and no longer being an advanced animal, but completely arbitrary. Plus, diff- plus different types of animals. A, it also closed the exploit where more powerful animals had a pe- had a penalty to effective level, which could be negated by taking feats. Um, and. They, and of course, with um, Bestiary 2, they had a loophole so that they could actually utilize Vital Strike feats without uh, without sucking. Um, I will admit that for 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 e druids, they ser- they first off the whole cleric but not argument was pretty much killed with that one when they introduced the primal power source. Um. Some people cried foul the fact that druids in fourth edition didn't have animal companion because, well, that was that was for the shaman, and 
the shaman is basically a druid specifically built around animal companion. And some and dru and um then you had a few you had a few interesting ideas from the from um essentials, but essentials kinda sucked. And then we get then we get five E where you have some changes to buff spells. Druids no longer get an animal companion, which I'm perfectly fine with because I, I really do feel that getting an animal companion shouldn't be mandatory for classes. I've never, re I've never really, um, never really jived with that. I do feel, I do feel it should be that um, animal companion should be an option. Because for all intents and purposes, it's a follower. Yep. And. If it's get, if it's gonna be if it's going to be mandatory, then build or then build around it a lot more than just a few static stats. That's why yeah. I, did, I didn't mind the sh I didn't mind the shaman in um, five e because you mean four. Sh yeah, so, sorry four e because so because um first off the shaman was a was a controller class. And the big thing, the big thing about the, how the shaman worked is, the point of origin for shaman spells could be the your, your character itself, or your um or your animal companion. They were essentially like a wizard's familiar in that respect. Yeah. And I'm perfectly I'm perfectly fine with that. But now we get now we get to the to the um. Up to the level up 5e version, and first off, the um, the idea, the core idea with with something like the druid is they're drawing is they're drawing from nature, and ultimately, I do I I've always felt that druids is is one of those classes that in an ideal situation should be split off into into different a, into different aspects, mm -hmm. because. Much like how, much like how the much like how the fighter is just supposed to be good at weapons, but that can make, that can make that class go in way too many different directions to the point where it becomes more of an archetype than a class. Consider the stuff that druids potentially can do. They have the they have the whole thing with nature magic. They yep. ha they have the they have the whole thing with um wild sh with wild shaping. And they've got mm -hmm. and they've got a bit of a nature themed skill monkeyness as well. Uh, druid craft. Mm -hmm. Cantrip is weird. So because because of that, I um I'm I would be I would be completely in favor of of split of splitting them off, um. And. I know, I know it's um, I know it's repetitive for me to bring up Thirteenth Age, but I don't mind the approach that it that it does, even if it's the longest class entry in thir in um, Thirteen True Ways, where it w where the Druid class was introduced. At the very yeah, least, good. it at the very least its approach is de is a decent enough idea. It had it had a lot of different uh, different ways that a Druid could be a Druid. Yeah, and I'm still telling you right now that they they didn't need to turn one of those druid paths into Mog the Moogle from Final Fantasy VI. <laughs> the terrain caster druid from Thirteenth Age is is literally just Mog the Moogle doing his terrain dances. That's it. That's it. It's that's what it is. You're dancing in ruins. Well, there you go. Ruins magic. But that's thirteenth age. This is not level up five. The geomancer, <laughs> for, the geomancer class from Tactics would like to have a word with you as well. Geomancer came after Mog the Moogle. Fuck you. He's the he's the he's he's the trope uh, codifier. Because the geomancer in a in Final Fantasy V didn't quite do that. No. Also, also, um, I think. I think that I think that the, I think that uh, I was gonna make some I was gonna make some sort of you can't spill nutrition without without coupon nut joke but nah 
can't spell nutrition without nut. <laughs> uh, I just remember, I just remember in nine where where apparently the the temptation of a Kupo nut is enough to is enough to get a Moogle who was stuck under a bell out. Well, Koopa nuts are a delicacy, don't you know? Yeah, then then again, um, then again, somebody has to enjoy enjoy pickled Geishel greens. You know the th the thing that no the thing that one bite of that knocks Ste knocks Steiner on his ass. And then pickled kiss. <laughs> pickled uh, Gisol greens. Uh, I remember that. Well, it could be worse. You could eat dead peppers. Mm, tasty, tasty <laughs> peppers that turn you into zombies. <laughs> but when it comes to the when it comes to the dru the druid for the f for the five e version versus the um. Versus what we've got now. Obviously, we still have to. We still have to, we're still limited to just the first ten levels. Yeah. Um. But, and because because of that, I th I think the spell I think the spell casting rate hasn't really ch hasn't really changed. What ha the main column that has changed is the number of wild shapes that are known. Yeah. Because let me. Ch because um in f and um core you could only you only got two charges of wild shape. In fact, it says you you can use this feature twice. You gain expended uses uses when you finish a short or long rest. And incidentally, I have to wonder if I'd hate the whole short short rest thing a little bit less. If it weren't for the fact that a short rest in 5e is an hour, whereas in 4e it was five minutes. Yeah. True. I just think that it's an unnecessary... Um limitation on a lot of different features and mechanics within the game. I, the one, I, I, will say, I will say one thing. The way that powers worked in 4E with you know, per encounter, at will, per day, etc. ADU. Yeah. They, they, were, they were... They made a lot more sense. And like, wild shapes maybe per... You'd, you'd either do it probably as a per day thing, yeah, rather I'll than just openly. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll just openly state I'm not a fan of the uh, the idea of resting to restore powers, regardless of an addition. I'm much more a fan of yeah a cooldown. Like I, I don't know, it just it feels unnecessary to me. Whenever, whenever the idea of a, whenever the idea of a cooldown is pre is presented in that sense, you usually hear a, usually hear intense reing from the folks go going, going. That's too that's too MMO like. That's too ga that's too gamist. I I know that they don't like the term, uh, cooldown. It, the reason I don't like the idea of a short rest or a long rest, I, uh, how frequently can I use a power? It's the same thing. It, can I use it every so often? Oh, I have to rest before I do it? Okay, how long is this rest? Okay, cool. It's the same damn thing. It's an unnecessary mechanic that doesn't need to be there. Yeah, I, um... I feel, I, I feel like this... I, I sometimes feel like these, sor these sort of mechanics would be, a, would be a lot less intrusive if you... Ha if you're using some setup where you actually had to roll for them. They weren't automatics. Um, well, and I, I do have to bring up a point that I know Ash has on previous uh, previous occasions. Um, make it make it a resource that you can uh, either substitute with other resources or say spend a level of exhaustion to continue to use. Yeah. Um, 
in some of them, even though even though they had a spell slot set up in um in L in L five R where the where um your ring determined how many of how many of those kind of spells you could cast. Um the approach that I that I always took with that was a was a escalating um an escalating difficulty level with do, with doing spell with doing spell casting i.e. your fir you can cast your first one at your first one at no penalty you you get the um the difficulty rises by 3 for eat for each one a each one after that and at the and one and once you've had some time to rest the count resets and that would be a better approach at the only time i'll say that uh uh, the approach of like say once per day versus you know you have to rest for a set amount of time would be beneficial or detrimental to the way that the game runs is if and please don't do this if you're a developer you allow you allow someone to manipulate the uh, day night cycle or how quickly time moves or doesn't move like, don't don't do this <laughs> do not do this but that's the only time we're saying once per day versus long rest versus short rest would actually work to somebody's benefit. Games like um, Exalted and Fantasy Craft and the like have the have the recovery time be essentially a scene change, and I don't mind that either because um, the because that's not a set amount of time that people have to be restricted by the G, the GM can um, can move for, can move with that kind of thing freely. Obviously, if somebody's doing a, a traditional dungeon crawl, that's not going to work as well. But at the but at the very least, it's something that can it's a um, paint that can be used on the canvas. Um, the the bigger the bigger issue for for me when it comes to this whole short rest long rest thing is the strength of the ability does it does not justify it. Like you look at the daily powers. For a lot of the classes in 4e, those tend those tended to be the ones that had the strongest effects, the strongest pure damage. Um, there what and there and a lot of times there was a bit of a um, balance where you could either do a lot of damage but not have much in the way of side effects, or slight or less damage but some extra effects. Um, and the but the thing is, those were those were the highest tier of it. So you could un so you could rationalize why you'd only be able to do those things once per day, or a cer or a certain amount of times per day. Yeah. It, as always, the, the the point we tend to bring up with the with the issue with day night or with um lo short short rest long rest is a uh, is that there are better ways to track and allocate those resources and to check for when you need more resources than to just say short rest long rest time incidentally i do find it funny that pe that i kept seeing people bitch about how gamist the whole aedu system was in for in um 4e and yet so <laughs> and yet 5 5e comes along and is even more egregious with that kind of thing yeah 4E got a bad rap. It definitely didn't. As far as far as the whole, oh, it, the the most common thing I hear I hear is that I hear is that it didn't allow for enough role playing. Except, I often I often feel like that I often feel like the way people talk about it, it's it it's in it's it's in this collective consciousness illusion kind of way. Because when I when I asked them what I asked them what made what had what um, in previous editions allowed for more role playing, I never get a consistent answer, or I get or I get an answer that's based on things that I can't use. Mm -hmm. you no, know, because I think I've made it clear I don't give a shit about feels. Yeah, exactly. I'm actually very curious as to that as well because that. When I hear that, it sounds like well, are is it is it the fault of whoever's running the game? Is it the fault of the people you're playing with? Like what what exactly has prevented you from role playing? Because I don't feel that's something you can squarely base on mechanics or being too gamist. 
Well, if you have a mechanical hook that that gives opportunity to role play, and the ADU system does, it's not too gamist to to, to say that that mechanical hook doesn't help inspire role playing because it absolutely did. Um, I the closest that the closest that I'm willing to give is that there is that there wasn't enough is that um there was the there can be the appearance of this issue in the way in the way um the way the the way things were presented i think that i think that's what people are focusing on but presentation is not the same thing as in practice and i really i really do feel that that's the reason why i um in the, when i did a video on this on this thing um a defense and critique of 4e i had said that a lot of the people who were making these kind of complaints, I compare them to the people complaining about "quote unquote" WoW clones in the 2000s, or the people complaining about the people um, complaining about Call of Duty when it was very clear that they had never played a um, a single Call of Duty game. They just had this um, impression of an impression of what a Call of Duty game was. Yeah, I can agree with that. Now, as far as the complaint that it that it was it was running out, um, the more the more tr the more um, the more high speed kind of style instead of the whole linear sequence thing, um, leave that one's a, that one's weak, but it's still kind of strong because well, let's be honest, the that whole linearity thing that was started by Half Life, and the thing, but the thing is, is that. And is that a third degree impression is still an impression. It's still it's still based on, um, on the idea of something and not what's actually present. And mm -hmm. I think that's the I think that's the reason why there was a big um, a big gap in assessment between people who actually sat down and read the rule set and understand understood what it was trying to do, and the people who just saw saw it from a distance. Um, I saw this exact kind of thing with Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 3rd Edition. Or the idea that they just turned Warhammer into a board game. And as some as some of you who are familiar with the stuff I've done with RVT know, I was able to run Warhammer 3rd Edition for, an in, in, for doing the Enemy Within campaign for a full year with more than my fair share of roleplaying. Yep. Especially since the the spin on the enemy within in um in um in Warhammer Fantasy Third Edition was basically a giant whodunit mystery. But when that's it comes a bit to, rails at this point. Yeah, <laughs> getting back on getting back on the rails. The the first thing that the first thing that I did notice is that they've significantly changed um wild shape. Because first off, is the is the max um, the max challenge rating when it com when it comes to when it comes to the uh, wild shapes that you can take. Because at um at originally at second level the max CR was one fourth. Yeah, but a one fourth CR creature could be something fairly underpowered. Or something at second level that was completely overpowered, depending on how you used it. Um, well, the th the w the way it worked is that um it says so ori originally how originally how it worked was you was um you did get wild shape at second level. You can you can use it twice, and obvious and um. Let's see, let's see how many t let me see how many times you get you get it in um three so you get That's like, you get it three times mm -hmm. the max C the the max C the max CR in um in the level up version is half going up to going up to one at fourth and fifth level. And then go, and then going up to two and eighth. So it's much high. It's much higher of a um, ra much higher of a rating, especially. And 
this also applies with the examples given. Like the example given for a, for a second level um, wild shape in core was a wolf instead instead of the ape that we end up getting. Um, and for fourth level, they give a br they give a brown bear, and the one that they had in um, core was a crocodile. It's also a nice touch that they put that they put in a sample AC on the playtest document. Mm -hmm. Um, and the whole and instead they also have they also. An interesting thing that they also do is that for second at second and fourth level you can't have a flying or swimming speed, whereas originally at second level you couldn't have flying or swimming, at fourth you couldn't have flying. Which do you think is a better approach? Um, considering how much they've been focusing on having an exploration pillar for the classes thus far with the exploration next, I can kind of see where they might have thought limiting both flying and swimming until fifth level was a good idea. But I don't think that the limitation would be necessary. I think that the original path of second, no flying or swimming, fourth, no flying, and then fifth, all, all limits undone, other than the actual challenge rating, uh, w would have been the better approach here. Simply because you may not be in a place where getting a form with swimming is going to be beneficial in any way, shape, or form, whether it's for exploration or combat. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not going to be assured that you're going to need a wild shape that has swim speed. Um, on, top, on top of that, uh, you can only change your wild shapes out every time you gain a level. And I know that we had this discussion last time of, of level versus... Uh, short or long rest with the with the switching out of styles amongst the rogue. Um, again, I, I think the idea of switching it out at every level is a, is a good idea because it, you, it's the accumulation of experience and, and studying in this case the type of animal that you want to be and, and necessar maybe you don't necessarily need the previous shapes that you've memorized and so you, you discard one to Im implement this new one. Unless you're in a place where you know there's going to be water and so swimming will be somehow useful. Um, limiting swimming is it just, it, it doesn't mechanically or fluff-wise make sense. And I find it to be an unnecessary uh, sort of limitation yeah. at, at that point. Um, one, th one thing that I, one thing that I had to double check to make sure that, to make sure if, to make sure um, it's in, it's in here. And not and not in and not in core is the temporary hit points, because um, when you use what when you use wild shape in the level up version, you gain a number of t you gain one d four times um, challenge rating of temporary hit points, with one one d four obviously being the minimum. Yes. Um. I get the feeling this is a means to um. To emphasize why why somebody would want to do it, even even if they're at low health, or at the because or, it the, keeps you. or at the very least to reflect the fact that you're in a different form, so your health is going to be different. Because yeah, th this isn't in core. I du I double checked that I double checked that. I th um, I think I think uh. Me mechanically, it gives you it gives you, you know, that little extra bit of 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 endurance, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, however, you want to explain that in in lore is up to you. But uh, I think that that's actually a, a somewhat good idea in order to prevent your form from immediately being struck down and you being phased out of it before you can really do anything. Yeah, there there was a whole rule about how, about how ex, about excess damage in core and some something else to note is duration. In core, you can only maintain wild shape for a number of hours equal to half your level. In level up, 
you can stay in it's instead of you drop the half part of that yeah and i think that makes sense as well a druid who's been among nature for a long time studying the wild shapes and has amassed that amount of experience in how they do things would be able to maintain it for a long amount of time they may even think like that animal more than they think like a person anymore yeah um or that tree also also, also i did shape i did um i did check cuz i i've got i've got my copy of the player's handbook and i've been look i've been looking back and f- back and forth between the two documents mm-hmm. um when it com- when it com- when it comes there are no additional um, wild sh- wild shapes known li- listing. The only the only limitation is that it's an animal that you've seen, which um, that is something that can be rife for abuse because someone could easily go, well, what if I saw it in a picture book? Doesn't that shouldn't that count? Um, and. <laughs> All that I end up thinking of is I I have I now have a better understanding about why Exalted had the whole heart's blood thing when it came to the Lunars. <laughs> because if you've se- if you've seen the an- because um just seeing the animal, um, that's something that I think can be taken advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. Like I- God damn it! I can't believe I'm referencing this. Even, 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 anim- even animorphs. That weird ass young adult novel I grew up with had a better understanding of this kind of thing. Animorphs, that weird ass young adult novel series that ended on the brink of another war, and that K. A. Applegate has been using to uh, preach about voting recently. <sighs> Chalk that up under another um, Casu, and yep. Let let's be honest. The 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 um. I'm not too surprised about that because the because the second response that she had to to the ending was not exactly classy. At the very least, the her other half, Michael Grant, had a bit more class and actually took the criticism to heart with his work after the fact. Yeah. Um, Ultimately. Uh, with a uh, with the wild shape, there's a there's a number number of other changes too. Um, it, you you have the PHB open for fifth. Was there a rule for wild shape being armor class twelve plus quarter druid level? Um, no. So this one says that if you uh, if you wild shape, your armor class is twelve plus quarter druid level rounded down. Uh, but if you, if your wild shape would have a higher AC than what that equals, you can use the wild shape's AC instead. Let me. S- the. The only. The only. Um, ca- the only case when it comes to that when it comes to that sort of thing is what it's is what it says for the whole game statistics replacement. I, i.e. replaced by the statistics of the beast, but you retain your alignment, personality, and mental um, ability scores. Um, you retain all of your skill and saving throw proficiencies in addition to gaining those of the creature. If the creature has the same proficiency as you and the bonus is higher than yours, use the bo- use the higher one. If the creature has any legendary or lair actions, you can't use them. I feel like the whole you can't use legendary or lair actions is a missed opportunity here. Yeah, um whereas with the level up 5e um it doesn't make any any mention of not being able to use lair actions as far or legendary or lair as far as I'm looking at no, so I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing I'm guessing that you I'm guessing that you could also In fact it says it says right here all the wild shapes senses, movement speeds, resistances, immunities, vulnerabilities, traits, actions, and attacks. 
Uh, and if you take a multi-attack action of a creature, you cannot make any further attacks that turn, even if another feature would normally allow you to do so. So, it, it, on top of that, uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not seeing anything that says you can't use legendary resistances or legendary actions or lair actions. Now, lair actions require that you're in a lair, <laughs> that you've established a lair. That's that's the limiting factor there, but. This means that I think that Level Up 5e said, we see that missed opportunity. Let's take it. Yeah. Um, the, other th the other thing, and this is one of those things that could go either way because of how it was handled back, back, in, two back, in, um, back in 2005, is in core, you can't cast spells and, you're, and um, your ability to speak or take any action that requires hands is limited to the cap the capabilities of your beast form. In in um in level up, you can only cast spells with a range of self or touch, and you can't cast spells that deal damage or inflict conditions. So you've you've got some spell casting ability. With but you're not getting the you're not getting the natural spell shenanigans from. Cobzilla back in 3.5. Unless unless you seriously load yourself up on buff spells. So, I could... S this is one of yeah, those things where I could see somebody using some some of the old buffed up um, wild shaping, but you'd have to put in a significant amount of dedication because you, you still have you still have a fairly limited um, cool. amount of spell yeah. slots. Yep. Um... It also mentions that transforming doesn't break concentration. Oh, how much we love concentration. Um, yeah, if it's a spell it that you've already cast. Yep, and it doesn't prevent you from taking actions that are part of spell, such as Call Lightning, if you've already cast it. So if you cast Call Lightning, then you go into your, uh, say, Wormling Bronze Dragon form, so you're immune to lightning damage. Um... <laughs> <laughs> you can then use you still use your action to tell the lightning where to strike. Mm -hmm. I'd say I'd say um po I'd say pound for pound this is a better version of wild shape than what's in core. Absolutely. Because of the fact that uh I'm pretty sure it took it took the uh the route where there was a lot of missed opportunities with Wild Shape and incorporated them in ways that weren't too overpowered. Mm -hmm. And these are and these are genuine missed opportunities, not a case of we're just playing the class wrong. Looking at you, Mike. I uh I actually really like the idea that um that with uh with casting spells and any abilities that require hands limited the capabilities of your wild shape. So that really then begs the question, if uh, one of these self or touch spells requires a somatic element, could you then say, well, that particular form doesn't have the required uh, dexterity for the somatic element? That, that's, that's an interesting mechanical hook that you would have to think around the limitations of, of your uh, of your particular wild shape that you're going to take mm -hmm. in order to get the maximum amounts of utility out of it. Yep. Um, and when then, then of course at um, let's see at at four at fourth seventh and ninth we ha we have um, we have exploration options. As we've as we've seen in as we've seen in past, and there's the whole thing with Nax where you're get, you're going to be starting with two, get a third one at fifth, and a fourth one at ninth. And we'll explore those when we get to them. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. When it comes to so um can't. Cantrips, it cantrips isn't 
hasn't ch hasn't changed all that much. Spell slots haven't changed all that much. Um, when it comes to that, it says C, it says C spells rules for general rules. So that's something that we'd have to hold off on until they put up a document talking about any changes to how how they're using spells. Yeah. Um, let's see you. Now, as far as far as the whole, I'm I'm okay. We have the whole thing that they have to prepare their spells, which I'll be which I'll be honest, I don't really use. <laughs> um, lar largely largely because I've never I've never used the whole having to prepare your spells because it's because um. It never really made sense to me, and the kind of spells that you need to prepare for would would count under rituals, which I usually treat separately. Yeah. Um. Plus, when plus when you can sit when you can sit, the whole the whole preparing the whole preparing spells thing only only seem to only seem to make sense um in very specific settings and situations. Usually, sword and sorcery style campaigns where magic is highly ritualistic. Mm -hmm. But. For some cla but for some classes, like say a druid, where it's all about the it's all about the natural stuff. Mm -hmm. Why should they? Why should they be? Why should they be preparing with ri with rituals, with ri with rituals and ceremonies and shit? I've honestly never understood that because it seems rather unnatural to have to go through a ceremony or incantation or ritual to cast a spell when. The whole purpose of the character is you know, not this should not, come naturally. Not necessarily. Um, using real real world analogs here, uh, actual Celtic druids, and in in a sense, most of what you know the the Catholic the homie the the Holy Roman Empire and and the Catholics referred to as the paganism of the world. Um, they they venerate they venerate nature through rituals that express the cycle of nature a lot of the time you know things like Beltane, Sawin uh, all of the specific uh, bonfire feasts and uh, other particular holidays that were observed as a celebration of the specific phase of nature you're in. Um, <clears throat> I can see why there would be some rituals for druids in this respect. That they take a look at how nature is doing a thing, and they want to affect that thing. And so they do so by imitating nature. That in and of itself is a ritual. Yeah. Um I think it I think it comes down to the down to the fact that um there are certain spells that are t that have the whole ritual tag. Um, yeah. Which is which again that t that goes right back to the whole I'm holding off on that un until um a document is put out spells. regarding spell casting cuz even though they even though they recently announced that they're finished with all the class um playtest pdfs that doesn't that doesn't mean that they're completely done period yeah classes are just one aspect of designing the game mm -hmm. um so yeah and i see so we have the we have the first set of options with um un, with untamed demeanor and with that we have the, a way with animals first hand naturalist and um ley line awareness um I find this to be a very interesting set of narrative hooks. Um, the, these mechanics can be used in a, in a, in a, in a narrative way with your, with your druid. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I think first-hand naturalist is probably the weakest entry mechanically. Because you just get an expertise die. And here they're, they're mentioning expertise die again. We only saw expertise die actually explained with Rogue so far. Yeah. And so... We're going to need more about how expertise die work in general, rather than in, on a specific class by class basis, before we can make a a further ruling. For the time about... being, let's assume that it works the same way that you just that you get an extra one d four. 
Okay, and so 1d4 on nature checks, and you can sub in wisdom if you'd like to. Um, I honestly see a way with animals and leyline awareness being used more both narratively and mechanically, mm -hmm. um, depending on the type of druid the person is playing. If this person is is what I like what I like to call the circle of super friends, <laughs> the the guy with all the animal friends. Um, a way with animals is definitely going to fit in there because basically druidic becomes your talk with animals cantrip without casting it. Yeah, you talk to them in druidic, they can understand you. I I have to say I would say. Uh... Leyline awareness is probably the one I would go with that I think is the most overpowered. A, yeah, you have to use a ritual for it, but considering the information it gives you, it... You don't, you don't have to use a ritual for it. Well, it says they, through uh, druidic rituals, you become attuned to the ley lines. So, I mean, well, yeah, I guess technically not. If you're attuned, then you're attuned. It doesn't necessarily say you... It just... It... It's not like you have to it's, use a ritual spell to do it. You basically just have to be on the material plane to do it. Full yeah. Stop. Oh, Basic, if, it's, if that's the case, then why wouldn't you go with Leyline Awareness? Well, for uh, for one, the the choices are here not just for mechanical, you know, min maxing reasons. They're also here to to give narrative importance to the character. Like a lot of these things are things that aren't necessarily in core. Or if they are in core, they're not necessarily the same. Um, I can I can safely say that when it comes to when it comes to these when it comes to the effects for a lot of these exploration knacks, they're either not in core or they're buried within either either feats or subclasses. Yeah. Um, with with leyline awareness here, this would be uh, for a druid. Like I can see this as as for a druid who is specifically traveling to rebalance nature for whatever reason, or if they're a scourge, an evil druid, um, to unbalance nature because oh. of the of the general health of the local ecosystem and the unnatural or magical upsetting the natural order. Yeah. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily need that. All that information that you can get with leyline awareness, you can technically get with away with animals just by talking to some animals. They'll, they'll, uh, you know, the, at the very least, they can give you information about nearby locations and monsters, including whatever they have perceived within the last day. Um, you know, th they'll be able to tell you where the nearest forest and where the nearest natural body of water and where the nearest city or other community might be. Unless your GM is an asshole and has the animal lie to you. Well, the thing I <laughs> yeah, there is that. the The thing I didn't like about a uh, way with animals is just the aspect of uh, knowledge and awareness is limited by their intelligence. So, again, as Mildred was saying, if your GM is an ass, you're kind of open your you're opening yourself up to 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 getting a an unpleasant time. Well, don't, don't ever let me ref a game for you, by the way. Because I could really fuck with you just because of that one line right there. Versus, like you said, you could get the same information from Leyline Awareness, so... Why? Again, again though, it, it, this, this really has to do with... It's not who, why you would specifically pick it. It's going to be what it's there for to give players in general. Player may not want Leyline Awareness. They may think that's just... That's not the way their druid is. Well, that's fair. I... Maybe it's just I look at a, I look at way with animals, and I actually think it's, it feels like it's missing something. I can't put my finger on what, but I, there's something about it I don't inherently like. All right, I can I can get I can get that. Um, and then, of course, at seventh level, we have druidic lore, which ha which has the options of druidic secrets, toxin, intuition, and waste not. Um, the so of of these, we have um, druid druidic secrets, where you where you can ca where you uh, can um, cast a spell from stealth. Uh, uh. 
But you can't you can't do it again until you finish a long rest. I, uh, um... that, that 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 is such a huge price for such a small thing. I really because do. You... I really do feel that this that that some that something like this. The catch should not be long rest because that because that means people are going to get paranoid about it. But more of you, if that um, I feel like th I feel like this should be um restricted behind a stealth check. Um, you know something about uh, Juridic secrets that kind of catches my attention ties in uh, ties in with what we were talking about with way with animals and. When it says creatures that can speak Juridic will also be aware of the uh, subtle motions and signs you use to cast spells in this way. Uh, underway with animals, it says you can uh, ask uh, ask or persuade a creature to uh, perform a favor for you. I would be I would be curious to see how people would use those two in conjunction with each other. Yeah, the big, I, the big prop. The only problem that I have with Druidic Secrets is this is not powerful enough to justify needing a long rest. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 but I'm not sure that gating it behind a skill check is going to be any... any way to do it. If anything, if you're... It, um, if you're covertly performing magic... Without attracting any attention, you, you you should already be in a situation where you're try where you're already technically in stealth. Mm -hmm. At the very least, uh, in some sort of uh, situation such as persuasion, deception, or uh, maybe even performance. Would you um, would you prefer if it was written that you can only use druidic se you can only use druidic secrets while you're hidden? I'm not even sure that would be useful. There's, there's a. At this point, it's a, it's a question of what is the right place, what is the right um, happy medium mm -hmm. that would make sense with this, and I just think you'd have to errata too much to do so. Um, I think. I do think I understand I, I, what it's trying to do, but I do think that this is one of those that needs some um, might need to get blown up. I mm, no, I don't. I don't think you need to destroy it or just excise it entirely. I'm not saying destroy um, it. I'm saying blow it up and start fresh. I think if I were going to modify it, I'd uh, refer back to fourth um, and make it a, a once per encounter, maybe. Um, or once per scene, depending on whether you were using it inside combat versus outside combat. Mm -hmm. That that would make the most sense. Like, you can do it once in the middle of battle, maybe as uh, maybe as part of your initial round of battle, because after that you're now focused more on d defeating the enemy or getting away. Um, and then outside of battle, you know, in a scene where you've got people paying attention to you, or maybe if you, nobody's paying attention to you, that's why you do it subtly, but then all of a sudden magical effects go off, so now people are looking around for the magic caster. Yeah. So it, there's, 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 there's a way to balance the limitations on this, but I don't think that those are going to be inherently within 5e itself, or even in this level up project, until we see more about how casting works. Mm -hmm. Now... Toxin intuition and waste and waste not. I don't have any problems with how the, with how those are set up. They're about what I would expect. Um, of the of the three of them, I could see waste not getting the most use. <laughs> yeah, waste not's a good way to. Uh, it looks like a, a really good mechanical hook for murder hobos. Mm -hmm. Or um, pack rats. Yeah, but it, it's it's supposed to be for uh, valuable cuts from a corpse. Mm -hmm. That recently died, thus murder hobos. Yeah, um, and then we have um, ferocity or or serenity, which 
Let's see, ferocity. Um, it you get even more. You get even more temporary hit points. One d eight. One d eight times C, times CR instead of one d four, and a plus two and a plus two bonus on attack rolls you make. Um. I'm thankful for the fact that they did a plus two bonus instead of doing you have advantage. Yeah, I know. I wish uh, I wish Ash were here to 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 gush over how how much better that is. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I'm sure he he then make the same point back to me. Well, it's not it's not the advantage disadvantage that he has problems with. It's the steps of advantage versus minor advantage and normal advantage, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. See, I can I can play out the conversation between me and Ash when he isn't here. <laughs> I, I, I'm still I'm still sad that he isn't here. Yeah. Um whereas <laughs> although now advantage on concentration checks to maintain spells. Mm, I really think that should have been a plus two as well, you know, balance things out. A pl a plus two on concentration checks? Or just a plus two to maintain spells? <laughs> or just get rid of concentration checks because concentration is bullshit. Mm -hmm. Um and set the ability to sacrifice a use of your wild shape in, in order to recover an expended spell slot. Um, it seems that with both of these, the second effect is what's, gonna, is what's going to be the selling point more than the first one. Yeah, and um, I think that's also a really interesting roleplay opportunity. These are fantastic mechanical hooks for that. They're going to... For, for a druid who has embraced ferocity... Um, they may be a druid, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're calm, because nature is not always calm. You have things in nature that are very, very fierce. You have tornadoes and earthquakes, volcanoes, floods, tsunamis. You have a ton of things that are in the natural world that are vicious and are going to tear things apart. Mm -hmm. Whereas embracing serenity evokes the the very stereotypical but also prototypical view of a druid as the wise man in the woods. The guy who knows what's going on uh, is calm because they are at one with nature at that time. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact that instead of bowing to their ferocity uh, um, and embracing serenity, they also then embrace the fact that they themselves are a part of nature and sacrifice their ability to shapeshift to get a few more spells. So, so it's them going, I need the spells more than I need to be in the shape of an animal. Um, I need to be me more than I need to be them. Um, because, because of that, it's, it's also... This kind of thing is also a nice way to... To indicate what indicate what you're specializing in, a lot um a lot bet a lot better than than just adding another subclass. Because I could easily I could easily see somebody arguing, well this would this 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 would both of these should be in should be in this or that subclass. And I'm like no, um, I think subclasses should be a little more specific than what this is doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 this this uh. I know that that um, Ash really liked looking at the ferocity serenity um, mechanic and how it would interact with uh, specific circles that you might look into. Mm -hmm. Then finally, we we get to the exploration pillar again, and I I really like seeing. I'm I'm really growing. Like these are growing on me. These exploration knacks, the the, pil the pillars of exploration that uh, level up five E really wants to build up. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I've pr I've I I've said it before and I'll say it again. I know I will. Um, it, it's a way to keep the class relevant all the time, uh, uh, in and out of combat, and not just for like oh I need that one random skill check to check for a poison while we're out in the in the mi in the middle of nowhere. No, this is a way to uh, make it so that, depending on the knacks you pick, uh, you're going to be really, really uh, relevant to what you're doing at some point. Um, I noticed that most of the exploration knacks given are. Uh, Again, they they feel like 
um, terrain based. <laughs> Mountains, tundra, mm -hmm. uh, eldritch ruins, marshlands, deserts, caverns, in the air or in the sea. Yeah, just on that note, the one I do have an issue with is uh, Master Forager. Why? It, you, you're going to forage for everything no matter where you are. Why would I pick anything else over that? Uh, again, it... Hey, look at Apothecary and then look at Forager. I feel like, again, it feels like there's something that needs to be there that's missing. So you're saying Forager just feels lacking compared to the rest of the necks? No, Forager actually feels like the best one. <laughs> hey, like, no matter where in the brush you are, you always know how to harvest nature's bounty. You have an advantage on any check made to locate, harvest edible flora in the wild. Yeah. Uh, no matter where I'm, no matter where I am in the wild, uh, unless I'm going for a very distinct spec. My opinion is the best one. Hang, hang on. I'm trying to re I'm trying to reload the document because um my. PDF viewer decided that it want decided that it wanted to derp on me. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, don't, don't you love technical difficulties? Yeah. Um, Started on what OBS did last time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, look, when it comes to the when it comes to when it comes to some of them, um, it. I do. I do have a. I do have a few. I do have a few um, questions, and I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure the question it is answered pretty easily. I, um, with stuff like aerial surveyor, I'm, um, I'm assuming that you can still use that even in wild shape. Um, um yes, actually, uh, back in back in wild shape, um, there there was the statement. Uh, you retain the benefit of any features from your class, destiny, or culture, and can use them if your wild shape is physically capable of doing so. Mm -hmm. However, you can't utilize any features gained from your heritage or heritage gift while in wild shape. This, this, the, the knacks are directly a feature of the class. Aerial Surveyor uses your eyes and ears because it's a perception check. Um, so while you're flying as a great evil, yeah, or great eagle, excuse mm -hmm. me, um, yeah. You you could absolutely use aerial surveyor. Well, that, again, that brings me to my question about master forager: is no matter where you are, you have an advantage. So why am I going to take something that only gives me a uh, a location advantage? I um here's the here's the thing: you start with two knacks, and you can get up to four by level ten mm -hmm. or by level nine, I think, actually. Yep. Not to mention you could switch out Nax um, during level up if if I'm not mistaken. I'm just saying that's just the way it's written. That's one I would always keep. I, there's no reason not to. Okay, and that might be true. That might be very useful. Then again, you may not ever need to make that check for uh, edible flora because half of half of the tables I've been at, both DMing and playing. Uh, nobody keeps track of trail rations. Nobody keeps track of what food you're eating. They don't care. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not always. Not. Not all of the minutia is followed. So if you no, already, that's fair. Yeah. If you already know your DM doesn't keep track of that bullshit, um, Master Forager is actually useless to you because you're never going to make that check. Um. There's also. It's one of. It's one of those things that is going to be very dependent on how, on um. On how on how anal retentive the DM is, yeah. Like, if they're the type of person who wants to do the the hardcore Oregon Trail level shit when it comes to their dungeon crawls, yeah, probably a good idea to have that. Um, possibly have herbal apothecary as well. Yep. No, that's fair. I, it's just one of those things where I read it and go, that seems it sounds. Sounds basic, but it's actually really OP. But if the DM doesn't really care, then well, it's not as it's not as OP as it may seem because of how advantage works. 
and this has always been my, this has always been um, an issue that I've had with the reliance on advantage. Um, because all that all that advantage is is um, you roll two d one, you roll two d twenty, and you keep the higher one. Yeah. You roll two d twenty, keep the highest score, uh, on on the single die. So, so maybe this is just me reading it and going, that sounds really good when in practice it might actually not be that good at all. It's That's not to say it isn't good, but it, but, but I wouldn't say it's as mandatory overpower as you um, thought it was. Yeah, it's it's not as polarizing as you might as you might have thought it was. Because there are some other really nice um, utility mountain climber to make your climbing speed equal to your walking speed. And an expert can die for athletic checks. <laughs> Funny enough, I was actually looking at the Marshlands one going, that sounds really nice. <laughs> I would like that. Some yeah, these... no extra movement while throwing... Mar like, they're situational. All of them are, in fact. Mm -hmm. And that's all, that's been the case with the Exploration Knacks throughout the classes thus far. Many of them are situational. But they're, they're nice in both the fact that one it's only one aspect of the Knack that's, fi that's situational. Like, for Mountain Climber, the, the situational part is you're acclimated to climbing to high altitudes. But the universal part is climbing speed equal to walking speed and an expertise die for any athletics chips made while climbing. Yeah. I would say that a few, a few, more, that aren't, a few more that aren't tied to an, envi an environment would be appreciated. Cause... Yeah, this one's this one's heavily environment dependent compared to compared and to both uh, fighter and rogue. The the um the reason that, the reason why I ha the reason why I have a bit of an issue with that is now I know I know there's the argument that um that the druid is a cl the druid is a class where you where you need to be environmentally sit situational and I can see that ju being justified. The issue the issue is. I, whenever it comes to these sort of environment specific um, classes, I could easily see situations that a GM could come up with that renders those um, choices moot. Yeah, largely because I've been in those I've been in those situations myself. Um, that happens. Um, for example, uh, a, a man-made dungeon in mm -hmm. this respect. The, the there'd be very very few of these that would apply. Yeah. Um. Uh. Tundra Explorer for the cold temperatures because that doesn't say you have to be outside for it to work. Mm -hmm. Um. Mountain climber for the climbing. Uh. That doesn't. You don't have to be outside for that to work. You don't have to be up in high altitudes for that to work. Um. And. Technically, Eldritch Survivor could be used in a man-made dungeon if it's a magical dungeon as well. Mm -hmm. But th that one's getting a little more situational. Yeah. Um, but... Desert, the desert, the one for deserts, again, acclimatized to hot weather and extremely high temperatures, and you only need uh, a similar arid environment. So if it's just a really arid man-made dungeon, you can still find enough water to sustain yourself for a day by spending an extra hour digging or extracting moisture. But that's only if you're in a, if there's even any floor in the dungeon. Again, that's you're getting more and more situational the further through the list you go. Mm -hmm. And part of the part of the reason, a big a big part of my design philosophy is I do not I do not care for traps. Not in not in the sen not in the sense of tra of traps and actual gameplay, but more of um. More of, choice traps. Yeah, choice traps. There were a lot of those with the way feats were arranged in 3rd edition and 3.5. Even to a lesser extent, Pathfinder. Where you have where you have um where you had where you had feats and keep, keep and keep in mind unless unless you were say a fighter, the amount of feats that you were gonna get is very limited. Where There's a reason the fighter was still called the feeder back then. Yeah. Where 
where um, it's just going to give you one static bonus, and that's your, and that's going to be your slot until the until two levels from then, or or in, or in a lot of cases, four levels. Four, yeah. Um, and because because of that, those kind of those kind of things would would end you'd you'd end up being traps, or you'd have the other issue where you had those long ass feet chains. And I know, I know, I bitch about whirlwind attack a lot, but I'm going to keep bringing that up because it's the perfect example of needing to overplan. You might want to explain that one to Doku. <laughs> whirlwind attack was a was a feat in third edition, and the requirements for it were at such a level where you ne you needed to plan out the route to get it. From very early on, that's the issue I have with that. Whenever you have a case of overplanning, it's instances where, in order to get a certain thing, you need to have planned way in it, way in advance, to the point where you're not really choosing freely. Your um, you've got you, your um, choosing how you say yes. Yeah, there's a reason that even looking at fourth and fifth edition, despite how much people complain about them. I'm really glad I skipped over third, um, and it's because of stuff like that. Now I'm I'm going I am grabbing the now the the idea with whirlwind attack is is pretty is pretty useful. Well, if you if you can actually get it, it's you're basically doing the spin attack that you see in a Legend of Zelda game. Yep. I mean, I don't have a problem with the concept, it, much like with a lot of uh, with a lot of stuff you see in. Uh, tabletop RPGs, not just uh, D and D. It's the execution of the concept that ends up making me go, mm, "Yeah, that sounds nice," but uh, in game, it sounds like an absolute pain in the ass, and for, I don't want to deal with it. For thir for um, three point five, this is what this is what you needed. You needed a Dex and Intelligence score of thirteen. You needed combat expertise, dodge, mobility, spring attack, and a base attack bonus of at least plus four. <laughs> you had to be at least level four at that point. Yeah, hard pass. I had, I'm pretty sure there's other ways I could deal with whatever the situation is that doesn't involve that. I mean, cleave, greater cleave, and imp and, mo and monkey grip. You get to wield a... a a two-handed weapon as if it were one-handed, and well, with greater cleave, every time you kill something, you can make a five, uh, five-foot move and attack something within that five-foot move. And, I mean, uh, let's be, let's be fair. If that's everything you need to do it, and you could pull off something that would inevitably be like really cool and gives you bragging rights, okay, sure. But that's pretty much what it sounds like to me. This is something you only do to have bragging rights, and. Make everybody else go. Oh wow! Look, that was badass. Did is it necessary? No, no, no not at all. Also, it's, who it's the, cool. also who the fuck use who the fuck actually needs to use combat expertise? That uh, that thing always ended up being so damn useless. Yeah. <laughs> what, what 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 does that feat do again? <laughs> it just get, it gives you more attacks of opportunity per round. I I know. <laughs> It's it's like, why do I need more than one AOO? What? I think the only time that I ever used combat expertise was when I was doing a spear build. Uh, and the great debate about uh, cat-like balance in Vampire the Masquerade versus combat expertise in 3rd uh, edition continues. Both useless. About as useless as Aqua. <laughs> hey, Aqua can... <laughs> And at least make water. She's more useful than either of those feats. It technically, yeah, Aqua could could hydrate you if you ever got lost in a desert. So she's more useful than Copper expertise and cat like balance combined. I mean, you can. Never mind. I'm not going to continue that thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say like... I'll just say Vaporeon meme and leave, and leave it at that. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like how there was a solid pause. And just nope. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> um, I, like I said, I'll just save a Porion meme and leave it at that. Now, when, now when it comes to when it comes to the 
subclasses because this is one of those things where normally this would be Ash's purview, but he he blew out his voice, so instead so instead he um he ended I'll up give it the old giving, college try. He ended up giving the te the text end of things. Um, because in the with the past couple ones we've looked at a handful of subclasses and what and how compatible or less compatible they'd be with the new with the level up version um and and they're always my favorite part of this entire thing i love listening to ash reason through them and sometimes changing his his uh rating as he reasons through them mm -hmm. um so i guess i'll read his responses for you yeah so we've got seven to go through and we'll start well I um I didn't bring up and I didn't feel like arguing about whether about the UE ones or dick or yeah. up which ones are UE and which ones were eroded into other classes although yeah. I don't think we have we don't seem to have that problem as much this time around there were a couple that there were a couple from Merle's streams that I could have brought up but I didn't um simply for the sake of my sanity this time so <laughs> I'll start it I'll start at the top um, Circle of the Lands. Says, thumbs in the middle. Land was effectively wizard but for nature, which is a pretty cool character concept, which is overshadowed by Wild Shape, and of course with 5e's lackluster spell casting. Uh, he then said that if the spells are suddenly impacted by the features like uh, ferocity, the Ferocity Serenity that I know that he found really interesting, uh, they could be brought to an interesting state. Um, personally, I'd, personally, I'd say... Personally, I'd say... Um... Circle of Lands is going to have a much more interesting interplay with the exploration knacks than anything else. Yeah, I could see that. Um, the uh, now, as far as the whole, I will say that the whole being able to regain spell slots is um is is kind of is kind of um outdone by the by the Serenity feature. Yeah. Um. But a, but a lot of this has the caveat of we don't know what sort of game breakers are going to be at are going to be over uh, tenth level because there's going to be some. Um, there's always there's always the game breakers around fourteenth that we mentioned. Um, Circle of the Moon, thumbs down, and he says hands down even. Mm -hmm. uh, the most interesting elements of uh, multi classing with Wild Shape are diminished by the over restrictive Wild Shape, um, and. Even though the wild shape in base 5e is more restrictive than what we have seen here in, in level up 5e, I can see Ash's point. A uh, wild shape here is is fairly restrictive compared to Godzilla, which is a good thing in my opinion. It makes it makes it so that Druid is not a, a must pick for any uh, adventuring party. But I, I can I can definitely see where it's all thumbs down because the the interesting elements are restricted by the actual mechanics of wild shape itself um although some although something that and of course of course one there's one feet there's one f one feet one um feature that is going to have to be that's going to have to be addressed in the level up version for higher levels when it comes to druid cuz at 18th level in core the whole you can't cast spells in wild shaped goes out the window, whereas here you have limited spell casting. Yeah. So, I do th I do think that Circle of the Moon is going to have a little bit of obsolescence. Um. I mean, gr I mean, granted, you, granted, somebody can do circ somebody can do um, Circle of the Moon if they want if they want to be the tanky boy. But I get the feeling that if someone really wants to be doing the tanky boy, they're probably gonna be using Circle of Ferocity. Yeah. Like, the more that I think about it, sir, I can see why um, Circle of the Moon is a hands is a thumbs down simply because a lot of the stuff that it brings to the fore um, are being covered by class features in the level up version. Yeah. Um, Circle of Dreams. Ash said, thumbs in the middle. Uh, it's very good uh, mechanical fodder. And the narrative through line is solid. Uh, but 
it is more passive in its mechanics, and uh, the effectiveness will depend on the creativity that the actual player brings to the table. Yeah. Um, big problem. The big problem with that with with that one is it's get is it's go, it's going to be GM dependent because if the GM doesn't want anything to do with the Feywild or if the Feywild doesn't exist in his setting, then there's no point. Yeah. Um, especially with the whole, especially with the whole being able to travel like the Fade do, which is to me is the only really interesting thing with Circle of Dreams. Mm -hmm. Um, Circle of the Shepherd. Thumbs in the middle. Uh, Circle of the Shepherd is really good mechanically, but the effectiveness of the subclass will depend on how the game treats summons, and since we can't see that in just the the class dress down that's that's going to be dependent. Yeah. Um I'm go I'm I'm putting that as a tentative with the asterisk of the of subject to change once we learn if there's going to be any changes to spell casting. There probably aren't going to be many changes, just some clarifications, but you know how it, you know how anal retentive I am when it comes to this kind of thing. Yep. Um Indeed, very aware of that. <laughs> Circle of Spores. Thumbs down. Um, it's just not a very impressive mechanic, and it would take a lot of, of homebrew and fiddling to change that. Let's see. Um, I'm not even sure I'd. I'm not even sure I'd use Circle of Spores because that was in the Ravnica book. Well, no wonder it was a uh, it was not impressive mechanically. It came from Magic the Gathering. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't mind Ravnica as a as a setting, but it got way overexposed. Because there were there were like three, because Ravnica's had like three full blocks. Yeah, f three or four, something like that. Well, I think they're on four. Yeah, it's got it's gotten re it's gotten rebooted way too many times. I mean, and I'm pretty sh and I'm pretty sure something I'm pretty sure there could be the argument of but you but you loved um, you loved Kamigawa to death and that got and that got three whole blocks. Yeah, and that was part of a three part trilogy. Man, I wish Kamigawa's cards were better. The shrines were cool. The shrines the shrines and and Hoodoons were cool. I liked the shrines. Um. I liked ninjutsu. I thought that was a nice. I thought that was a, a nice um, keyword, and bushido on a lot of on a lot of um, white ki a lot of white creatures made sense. Yeah, as long as we don't talk about uh, the Amon Ket block, we're we're fine. <laughs> now, um, now stuff stuff like aura that stuff like aura and some the stuff that was in them um, saviors that was pushing it. Like I said, I just I wish the Kamigawa cards were better. Oh, <laughs> make Anastra great again. But <laughs> God damn it! But spores <laughs> as a, but spores as a as damage as damage streamers and being and being a bit chunky at high levels. I feel like that's something that's being covered by the core class as it is. Yeah. Um, S circle of stars. Uh, this was where Ash got really enthusiastic. This is all thumbs up all the way. Uh, it, rich in mechanics and flavor. Uh, gives you multiple uses for and of the same mechanic without becoming overpowered. And it synergizes well with builds meant to make use of the entire action economy. So this is, uh, this is something that, that he was very enthusiastic about. Um, Circle of Stars lets them, lets them um, use constellations for with a um, wild shape and given how wild shape in level up is objectively better mm -hmm. this is something i could see because you have three you have three constellation options the archer which you're which you're going to be you're going to be um doing doing magic ranged attacks the chalice you're going to be doing more healing and the dragon which is going to help with concentration and skill check bonuses which um is kind is kind of fun is kind of funny that it that it does that it, that we're bringing up the whole concentration thing with the dragon given the whole you can't you can't spell cast while you're in wild shape thing. I'd say <laughs> um 
I would be very interested to see how the, to see how the dragon constellation interplays with um, the spellcasting rules for level ups wild shape. And the, yeah. apparently, apparently, he's in the minor, he's in the minority when I asked around because a lot of people don't really care for Circle of Stars. I, I didn't have too much of an encounter with Circle of Stars. Like I said, I, I stopped playing Five E pretty early in its life cycle, so I didn't get to encounter anything that was in Tasha's or Zenithar's or anything like that. Um, but from from the small the small blurb you gave here and some of the overview I've been looking at on. Uh, well, on not one d four chan on the other one of the the wikis, uh, um, uh, I people I feel this goes more into my feelings about how people start approaching D and D in general, and this is a an attitude I've seen becoming more and more pervasive, even all the way back since two. People complain about gamification D and D and yet more and more people are gamifying D and D by min maxing like you would for a video game than ever before. Especially in fifth. I see it all the time. Oh, I'm not gonna use that circle ever because it's just it's not gonna give me the numbers I want. I'm like if you wanna play a game where big numbers are a thing, go go play go play, you know, Monster when Hunter. I, if if some of you may recall, when I did that defense and critique video, I had said that if you want to, if you if you want a game with a, with role playing mechanics, why are you playing D and D? Like there are there are games that do place a lot more emphasis on narrative and role playing. D and D is not one of them. If you really want that kind of thing, you'd be much better served playing um, PBTA in this case specifically Dungeon World. Or um, a or a fantasy themed world of adventure for fate, like something like Legends of Angelair. Um, hell, even, hell. <laughs> with the amount of skills that are in Roll Mass, you'd be better off. You one could argue you'd be better off going with that. <laughs> um, I, that's not exactly the best argument, but the but the point is is that. You're dealing with a game that was a spiritual successor to a miniature war game, and you're com and um you're complaining about ga about gamification. And I do want to make clear on something. I have I've had this issue not just with D and D fan bases, but with fan bases of all kinds of different games. Um, you're you guys are probably familiar with the times that I've talked about the two D twenty system that's used in um, Conan and Star Trek Adventures. I've seen people yeah. refer to the those that game's mechanics as too gamey, especially the heat gauge. Um, and I um I always find it ridiculous. Large largely because of the fact that at the end of the day you're still playing a game, and you're still you're still going to be people are still going to find ways to bend and and break no matter how much they claim that they're doing it for the story. Um. Whenever somebody talk, whenever somebody talks about how it's all about the story, not about the mechanics, I I always roll my eyes. That's why I've, that's why whenever you've seen me say the whole oh it's about the story, I always end up doing with a with a heavily sarcastic tone. Yeah. Because it very much feels like a excuse, a bandage. Yeah. Oh, but getting back on the rails. Last one on the list we have is Circle of Wildfire. Not to be said, it was a. Go ahead. <laughs> not to be confused with Armor of Wildfire. And not to be confused with Spellfire. <clears throat> Ash was a uh, tentative thumbs up for this because uh, Flaming Spirit is a lot of fun to use and an example of companions done right in the game. Um, has some easy mechanical hooks for the serenity and ferocity aspect of the uh, level up 5e druid. But the the thing that's going to be the deciding factor is how is level up 5e dealing with companions? Depending on how they're dealt with, Circle of Wildfire could be completely uh, moot and pointless. Um, when it comes when it comes to 
when it comes to when it comes to cir um circle of wildfire um the the whole the whole wildfire spirit i always i always joked that that felt like a familiar but they didn't want to admit it um i'd say i'd say i'd say that it that It's one. It's one of. It's one of those. I always feel that the circle of wildfire isn't do. Is doesn't have an. Doesn't um. Doesn't lean in. Doesn't lean enough towards what it seems to want to, or rather, in some cases, it um. It seems to run. It seems to run a bit contrary to the to the to the description, you know the the. The fluff for Circle of Wildfire is uh, is all about the na is all about using fire as the natural cycle, you know, ritual burning and all that. Mm -hmm. But the way it ends up working, it really doesn't feel like that. It just feels like a druid that can do some, that can do some bit some support and and burninating. <laughs> burninating the countryside, burninating all the peasants. Um, Insert Goblin Slayer meme. <sighs> <laughs> you left the door open. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sideshow Bob and all that. <laughs> but I will, I will say the aside aside from some effects that could probably use a bit of a rewrite. I do think that it's a net positive when it comes to the druid in this case, but the, the um, the but I have to put a big asterisk because there are two if there are two effects that in um at high levels and both both of them happen in, happening at the last couple of levels that I'm curious if they're going to keep those more or less as is or if not, or if not and those are timeless body beast spells and arch druid um. Timeless body and B spells are at 18th level in core. Um, the former, mm -hmm. any, um, basic, basically your basically your body only ages one year for every ten years, which is, j which is mainly for role playing effects. Um, and but B spells says you you can cast many. You can perform the somatic and verbal components of a druid spell while in a beast shape, but you aren't able to produce ma pr provide material components. Um, I'm curious. I'm curious if they'd keep that as is, or if they'd, or if they'd um, change that because of the way uh, wild shape works in level up. And the last one, you can use your wild shape an unlimited number of times. <laughs> so that's a. That's one hell of a that's one hell of a leap because up until that point you can only use it um t you can only use it twice. I think with the wild shape progression that they have in the actual ten levels we can see, they'll they'd likely keep it as the capstone because that is the capstone mm -hmm. skill that you can wild shape endlessly. Um, and they might just keep your your wild the number of forms you can know limited which that i i can definitely see that and i i know there's the whole thing about no about nobody playing up nobody playing at that high of a level but i don't know, i don't know people might people might play at that high of a level if you give them a reason to you know give them rewards aside from just more hit points hooray more hp yeah, this is where I'm gonna say, never, never, ever tempt people, because they will find a reason. Um, 2C Gaming has already put out several supplements regarding epic level play, so there is at least an there is at least an avenue where this is where this is being addressed. Epic level play, where 3.5 became its most broken. You want to talk about? You want to talk about most broken? Have you ever read the Immortals handbooks? Stop! <laughs> stop right there! <laughs> you stop right there! You son of a bitch! <laughs> I believe the answer would be yes. You don't understand, but, uh, Doku. 
You don't understand. I, I think this just adds to my point. Don't don't stop halfway when it comes to developing something just because nobody's going to do it at this level. Yes, they will. You don't have to give them a reason. They will. They will make up a reason to do it. Just assume that they will and balance things appropriately. Yeah. I've, I've seen some people make... I remember that there was an argument a long time ago that um, that you should only be going up to six level because anything higher than that is um, it is either not going to have enough of a challenge or you or um you're, or it can't, or it distracts from the whole um whole advent whole adventurer thing. I disagree with that and for a couple reasons. One, consider consider the. Consider the person who wants to emulate the crazy ass adventures that they've seen on certain um, metal covers. Eh. You want a recent example of this kind of thing? Look at all the covers for any Eternal Champion album. And se and secondly, the fact that you have po have extreme power fantasy games like Exalted that exist and Godbound, which is essentially a more a saner version of exalted saner not sane mostly because kevin crawford is an absolute genius and then you <laughs> and of course and of course there's also the fact that with with um fourth edition you had an interesting hero's journey when it came to the three tiers which they tried to implement the whole tier thing with 20 levels in um, in 5e, but there's no mechanics built around it, so it's ultimately pointless. Um, uh, I'm just I'm just gonna use a stupid example. It's not a it's not fifth edition. It's vampire. If you don't think somebody will do something stupid for the sake of just doing something stupid. I would like to remind you that I had a Malkavian with a strength of 10, a dex of 7, a celerity of 7, a potence of 7, and How a fortitude get... of 7. How did you get elder level fucking skills? What? Who the hell was your storyteller? How the fuck did you ever get those skills? <laughs> Legitimately. You shouldn't have gotten to 5. No. The Albert. <laughs> I got a really, really, really I got a really, really, really stupidly lucky roll on Diablerization, and uh, the ref couldn't tell me I couldn't because I rolled, I rolled three tens and a nine. So no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Yeah, you I, I, to Diablerize like a fourth gen. Fuck I did. You. Actually, no. I Diablerized a third gen. You Diablerized already... an Antediluvian. You Diablerized an Antidilute. No! <laughs> Fuck <Yep>. you! <laughs> That's not allowed. Your, your vampire burns trying to drink that blood. Fuck See, this you. Is, That's this my, is my This is my point. Never underestimate the dice and never underestimate that there's somebody willing to do something stupid because if they succeed, you end up with that. I hate to admit it. Zan, but he's got a point. Don't we always he's, say around here the dice gods show no mercy? He's got a point, but god damn it, as a storyteller, I'd be like, okay, you diablerize that that uh, that uh, that blood. Now give me your character sheet, and you'd be like, why? Because the will of the antediluvian takes over your body as an NPC again. Fuck you. <laughs> See, that's the funny part is that my character. Well, this was funny enough. The character that I was telling you about before that thought he was Batman, then realized he was Malkavian, suddenly became a. Uh, Mr. X from the Resident Evil games, and then was used as a <laughs> NPC to torment the rest of the party, while I get to sit there and laugh at them in their horrible, horrible misfortune. Oh, uh, um, by the way, uh, my character was also... My character had one... You, I can't even roll to, to do anything about this, but if he ever sees a potted plant, he runs away in fear. <laughs> That, that that's part of, that's part of your de your your dementation as a Malkavian. But that, yep. re regardless, <laughs> my point is, whoever your storyteller was, was just like they let who 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 did you even find? Which antediluvian? There's like two left. Uh, let's just say that there's a uh, uh, there's a casino, and there might or might not be some sedites involved. 
again, this was something the storyteller didn't think I was actually going to succeed at. It was actually meant to kill my character, but as Mildred said, the dice gods are are mischievous, to say the least. They show no mercy. This is why a storyteller slash GM then counteracts with, fuck you, your character's mine. That is my... We, that is one of my... <laughs> That's one of my favorite things to do when someone tries something that stupid. Fuck you, your character's now an NPC. Oh no, that's exactly what happened. Is my character became an NPC and I had to write up a new one and that character sheet became a... Uh, well... <sighs> they, they stalked us through the rest of the game. <sighs> We've all so. had that one instance of rolling 18 one too many times to the point where the GM asked us if we loaded the dice. And we're using their dice. Yep. Yes. The the thing is, I was even I was even using an online digital dice roller, and they maybe screenshot it and show them. They say, oh, "Okay, well, that's fine." Uh, what are your character stats again? Yeah. Okay. Go write up a new character sheet. Oh, son of a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's how it happens. Bes besides, we've already we've already talked about how the I um. My stance, my stance on min, my stance on min max is that is that it is part, it is part of it is a essential part of um, play. That's try, yes. trying to trying to get rid of min, of min maxing. Um, you can try, you can try, but people are just going to find different ways to min max. It's ju it's just in, it's just an inevitability, and there's always going to be an appeal in finding in finding ways to break the system. That's why oh. we, that's why we brought that's why we brought up stuff like pun pun and Cod, and Codzilla and the like and why um I haven't why I've enjoyed torturing some of my old DMs with the source salad and builds I've done over the years. Oh, Powerers, you mean... God damn it! The yeah. name is Powerers. <laughs> you mean like when the ref tells me that I have to write a uh, thorough backstory for my character, so I start as an Amina and then go to a ghoul and then go to a vampire. Doku, one of these days, I will have to expose you to the legend of Old Man Henderson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic TG stories. I, I'm just Old saying, if my skills are mana, force-filled, and toughness, and then I get potence, and then I get fortitude, along with the tenebration and auspects, eh, <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> How many points do I have to spend again? Too many. Yeah. There's also there's also the fact that I'm pretty sure you I'm pretty sure you'd do some completely unholy abomination things if you ha with en with enough time and dice in um well either version of mage. <laughs> uh, are, you just... to Doku? are you talking to Doku or are you talking to me now? Yes. Oh, uh, let me let me just <laughs> let me just put it to you this way. I actually did a character that was a uh, that was a uh, Numina. That then got turned into a ghoul and then a vampire. But as far as my character was concerned, I am a cook, and I carry around a walk, and everything is food. So, uh, there's at least three exalted characters I've seen that have done that. There's a character in one of my friend's five E campaigns who's a zombie chef that does that. <clears throat> oh, see, the problem is I never took eat and drink. But. Well, my, plus, my, my. plus, I I remember I remember a friend of mine having having a um orc having having an orc chef as an as an NPC, and the reason why he was such a good cook is he is because of the fact that he saw cooking itself as a battle. And I want to make clear this was about ten years before Food Shelby Wars was even it. out. <laughs> is that no. wrong though? No. Uh... Um, to, to re-rails us here, yeah. uh, Doku, final thoughts about the Druid class? I like what they've done. It feels, despite my limited experience with uh, 5e, this feels more balanced. There are, there are questions I have that are answered, and I do feel like there are some really obvious skills you should take that kind of overshadow everything else i usually don't like that it but that being said they also offer some things where if you're very specialized in something you're really really good at it i could see that being fun or being an absolute pain because 
it be being specialized, it doesn't mean you're actually going to be useful. Mm-hmm. I, I'm kind of on the fence. I, is it an improvement? Yes, I do think it is an improvement, especially from a mechanical standpoint. My issue is more with the way things are worded and set up where it I would just say I don't I don't really see a reason to play a druid class under this sort of uh, structure. Which is probably a good thing because it means I'm not playing a stupidly OP character. I'm yeah. playing a character that's gonna have to rely on the party and is only gonna be good at certain things under certain circumstances. So eh, Overall improvement, uh, do I love it? No. Do I hate it? Absolutely not. It's balanced, I suppose. Uh, I need to I need to see like what you guys are saying. I need to see the spell casting and some of the other stuff that happens above level 10. Uh, but for the most part, it, it seems like a decent rework. I don't really have much gripes with it. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, as, as for you? Yeah, as for me, um, I like the direction they're taking it, but I do think that some some of the uh, features were too specific. They were, it, it's almost like they focused on the gimmick rather than on the, on the actual balance with some of the, some of the features, especially with, um, the, the, the two... Uh, oh, what were they called? The the one at third and the one at seventh. The choices you make there. Um, there are some there that I can see getting a lot of play, and some that'll get none because of how specific it all is. Uh, and it, especially the exploration next that could be easily made moot, depending on what the DM does. Um, and then, of course, it, it's not possible to do a full analysis without knowing how they're treating magic in general. Mm-hmm. So, tentatively, I like where it's going. I, I can see the mindset. There's a few tweaks here and there I think need to be made. But without seeing more about spellcasting in general, I can't make a concrete decision. I'm The one thing I will say real quick. Go ahead. Just as a, a mild afterthought. Since we did bring up a role-playing... You could you could make a really really intriguing character from a role play standpoint with all the information they put out. Like even if your character is not necessarily viable in the situations they find themselves in, you do have a a lot of possibilities with making a very very good character with a lot of strong personality, thus leading to a lot of role play uh, role play possibilities. So that's definitely a positive because that's something I've kind of had a an issue with in terms of 5e is everything feels very cookie cutter. This doesn't have that same type of feel to me. Oh. But I can definitely I can say that the ent- for this entry this is definitely a I had, I had predicted that this was going to be a shit show. This was not as much of a shit show as I thought it was I was going to be. There are some there are some asterisks that I need to put in specifically um with the other classes that we've covered, I can kind of see where the pattern is going to go at higher levels. With this one, there's too, there's too many questions that I have for levels levels 11 through 20 and how they're going to be handled c- compared to core. So I'm, I'm giving it a tentative thumbs up with the asterisk of may, cha- may change once I see the higher level um, versions, which we're probably not going to see for a while. So... That's my, that's my take. Um, next week we won't be covering a class per se, but we will be covering a mechanic that, depending on depending on who's running, isn't utilized as much and what and in my personal opinion was a little bit undercooked. But that's just me. And that being um, inspiration and destiny. And when I immediately saw the destiny thing, I thought of the destiny system in um, Star Wars Saga. And if I'm mm. if I'm being reminded of Star Wars Saga, that's certainly a good st- certainly a good start. But we'll see if that actually holds up next week. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay 
fucking frosty, everybody.